Hey guys, your host George McKay. I'm here in studio today with a very special guest via phone from Tampa, Florida. I have on the phone, I'm very excited to announce this, Mr. Technical, Barry Horowitz. How are you, sir? Great, George. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you so much for uh, for getting in contact with me and being able to set this up. This is a huge, huge honor for me to sit down and talk with you. I watched you as a kid growing up, so to be able to talk wrestling with you for the next 45 minutes is pretty spectacular. I'm glad you're making me sound old, George. No, sir, not at all. Just making you sound like the le- <laughs> no, sir. Just making you sound like the legend that you truly are. Oh, I appreciate it very much. Thank you. All right. So the first question I always ask in any interview that I do is: there's always a defining moment of when everybody fell in love with the sport we're going to be talking about today. Do you remember your okay. defining moment? Yes, <clears throat> vividly. My defining moment, I'm going to say, came between 13 and 15 years of age in St. Petersburg, Florida, where I'm from. Went to school, graduated there. Uh, We were moving into a a new house, my parents and I. And you know how you got things disarray in the house and you're trying to set up and you're moving your furniture? Well, we had a TV set and you, you just threw it on top of a box for right now until a moving truck came and what have you, and you're setting up snack tables and chairs until everything gets situated. Well, for some reason, uh, the TV was tuned to WTOG, which is Channel 44. Uh, It was a big station back then. I I think it's called something else right now. I'm not sure, but it's relatively the same. And here I see these guys wrestling, Thunderbolt Patterson and Mr. Clean. And I'm watching the match, and I go, what the heck? I was hooked from right there. Right there, my long-range goal in life was to be a professional wrestler. Wow. That was my defining moment. And then the thread slowly unrolled, unraveled, and just kept on going until I achieved my goal. Perfect. So when, uh, when did you start training, and who did you start training with? Okay. Well, first of all, on and off, any job I took, I took, I was, you know, I was young, single. I knew it wasn't going to last, but I never would tell employers that, you know, and they're not going to believe you anyway. And the ones that didn't, well, you've watched me on TV somewhere, I'm sure of it, or heard about me. So like that Toby Keith, go, that Toby Keith country song goes, how do you like me now? <laughs> By the way, country music's my hobby. So that's why I threw that in there. Anyway, uh, I started part-time jobs, training with the weights, the dieting, and what have you, watching a lot of films, watching a lot of wrestling, lots of any kind, Japanese rent tapes, um, World Class Championship Wrestling, NWA, Gordon Soley, Georgia Championship Wrestling, and that's what I wanted to do. And it was hard to get in at the time, because they would discourage you not to get in or they would try to hurt you or what have you. So I went through the ranks. I started at a youth center in uh, St. Pete, amateur wrestling, went on there from junior high to high school. I took over I one state. I went to FSU and wrestled for a year. I didn't continue. I did not graduate. I went there. I uh, went to wrestle and also I took up uh, sports nutrition and I'm actually a certified nutritionist now. So Fantastic. Yeah. What I did was, then I was pers- I pursuing wrestling. And the reason I left FSU is because I had a chance to train and turn pro. And that was my dream. And I, I don't know if I'd be speaking to you on the phone right now if I took the option, if I took the other choice. Mm-hmm. So it was very hard to get a hold of, of somebody. And I had a friend of a friend that knew a very successful businessman in Florida. His name is Lenny Greenberg. He passed away. A a successful entrepreneur, uh, did very well. And these types of people know people in the know, and that's what happened. Basically, he knew somebody who knew somebody who knew the great Malenko. And I basically got a tryout or a training um, interview, if you will, in Tampa. I went to this judo school run by Ed Malley. He's a judo champion. By now, he's in his 80s, if he's still alive. 
it was a rundown studio, judo, judo studio, and I was in a small room with about 10 or 12 guys taking a lot of falls, bumps, wrestling on judo mats. That'll toughen you up real quick. And I was being taught by the great Malenko, his sons Jody and Shelly, which they're fantastic. And uh, everybody was fantastic in there. I mean, we had like 12 guys. Some, I, I hate to say this, but I think the only really ones that made it and made it big in that class was Barry Horowitz and the uh, Latin lover, Al Perez. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. And uh, that's what happened. And time to time, he would bring other wrestlers in. But the most I was impressed with was uh, Carl von Stroenheim and also the great, late Carl Gotch. And uh, I stayed there for about a year and a half, three, four days a week. We graduated to a mattress factory, which had a ring. Then it got another ring. It's about 104 in the summer and about 40 degrees in the wintertime. <laughs> I was trained there for three hours a night. Besides my job, besides my weightlifting, uh, that was my life. That was it. There was no partying, no going out. It was all about the dream and regiment and discipline and fight, you know, and, and striving for that goal of perfection. So I eventually kept it up, kept it up. I stayed training for a year and a half. I don't know how these guys today get broken in in three months because <laughs> three months is uh, nothing. Yeah, in, for sure. In my, in my world, anyway. Yeah. So I was ready to leave. It was time to get polished now. I mean, you know, Malenko helped me build the foundation of a wrestler, but now you got to travel. you got to know the ins and outs of the business, the locker room, the camaraderie, everything. There's a lot to learn. So he gave me a sheet of pa a sheet of paper that had various promotions on it. Don Owens in Portland, Carlos Colon in uh, San Juan, uh, Gorilla Monsoon for the WWF, um, Jim Crockett Promotions. There was all one. So I decided to get in my car and I drove to New Jersey and I rented a house. And I called Gorilla Monsoon up at his house from a payphone. And here I am, probably 20 years old, and this guy's a veteran, and I'm trying to pull a fast one on him. You know, I would love to work for you guys. Well, how long have you been wrestling? Two years. No, I wasn't. I lied. I mean, but it was a, a white lie, if you will. And uh, I got a tryout, and of course, back then, they would hold TV every three weeks in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and Hamburg, Pennsylvania. Every three weeks, back to back, Tuesday and Wednesday, they would film various shows. And I normally would wrestle six times in two days for the next year. And they started giving me little shows, house shows here and there. And then it was time for me to fly again. After the foundation was even more so, I needed to get more polished. So they sent me to Crockett Promotions. I was actually supposed to go to Portland. And it was filled up. And uh, Jimmy Superfly Snooker was going to help me get there. But uh, Vince Sr. sent me to Crockett Promotions, Jimmy Crockett, and I stayed there a year and a half. And I was wrestling six nights a week in the car, 3,000 miles a week in a car. One, once a month, you get on a plane and go to uh, Canada. I'm traveling with the likes of One Man Gang, Ric Flair, Bob Orton Jr., Rufus R. Jones, Boogie Woogie Man, Jimmy Valiant, Johnny Weaver. Uh, that list goes on. Rick Steamboat, Mark Youngblood, Jay Youngblood. I mean, just who's who of everybody. Bugsy McGraw. Uh, it was a, it was really uh, it was an institution for me. I stayed there like two years. I was on the first Starcade, Starcade '83, when I think uh, Rick Flair defeated Harley Race for the world title. Um, yeah, Jerry and Jack Briscoe were there. I mean, it was a hotbed for pro wrestling. So I stayed there, uh, two years, and then I came back home to Florida. And always wanted to work for championship wrestling, you know, because as a kid I was always watching that, and, um, Gordon Soley and what have you. And I stayed there, I guess, about a year or so, and dream came true. I defeated Mike Graham in his hometown for the Florida heavyweight title. 
And normally when you hold the Florida heavyweight title, like people like Bob Roop, Jack Briscoe, Mike Graham, you're in line for the world title. I mean, this was a big whoop de doo And beating Mike Graham, one of my idols? I mean, oh my God. So I guess I stayed there about a year or two. And then I moved to USWA, also known as Mid-South Championship Wrestling, owned by uh, the great, um, uh, God, I'm sorry, uh, Jerry Jarrett. And that was awesome. But I was only there less than a year when Vince called Junior. They called me back to come back to work there. Right. And that was awesome because... It was on fire there. I mean, I was wrestling a lot. I mean, I would, you'd get a couple days off back to work, a week off back to work, two days off back to work. I mean, it was unbelievable. I mean, I was in the pile driver video. I was um, going overseas. It was just incredible. Monday Night Raws came. It was just, I went on and on, and uh, I got a neck injury, and I was out about 11 months. And the roster was full, so I went to WCW and worked for them. Right, and your your stint in, your stint in WCW that was uh, it was a short one, right? It was only a... yeah, it was a short one. I went back to Vince, and then I went back to W. Went back to Vince, which was when I got my great big break with Skip, uh, the Body Donnas, and uh, that was my probably my biggest break in my career. And then uh, went back to WCW, and then. Vince bought it out in 99. Right. From there, the next 10 years, 8 years, I just did independence. And then I decided that was enough, the traveling, and relied on my uh, nutrition. So now, I still do that, but now I'm back on the circuit. I'm just nursing some injuries now. I'll eventually get back in the ring, but right now it's just meet and greets, seminars, hands-on training, inspirational uh, testimonies and stories of the road that are all legit and true you know it's it's not all about entering the ring and getting your trunks and boots it's it's all it's the whole gamma that makes a good professional wrestler the interviews your wrestling your personality uh you know your your passion for the business so yeah, no, I mean, it sounds, it sounds, it's, I gave you the fast version of my career. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, but it sounds, it's, it's super interesting. I mean, you mentioned so many legends that you were around and, and I just want to touch on, um, something that I was, uh, I, I wasn't able to see because it was a dark match, but I do want to talk yeah. about, uh, SummerSlam. You faced yeah. Owen Hart in a dark match. How, how was that? I mean, it's one of the major fours. I get it. It's not one of the TV matches, but it's a major four and you're facing someone who would eventually become a legend like Owen Hart who, in my opinion, because I'm a big Owen Hart fan, he left us way too soon because of an unfortunate accident. But that talk me through that moment, that match, when you're you're fighting somebody. I mean, you're you're very technically gifted, you are, and then you're fighting somebody like Owen Hart, who's also technically gifted. I mean, when you have two technical powerhouses in the ring, talk me through that okay. match. Which match are we talking about, George? Because I wrestled Owen Hart probably more than anybody in the wrestling business. I believe this was, was 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 in 1993. You wrestled okay. you wrestled Owen Hart at SummerSlam in a dark match, and later you went on to gain a couple victories against uh, the likes of Mike Davis, Scott Taylor, and in November you made your pay per view de- you made your pay per view debut uh, under a mask at Survivor Series. But I'm talking about SummerSlam '93. You wrestled a dark match with Owen Hart. Okay. Wow. I know uh, I'm asking you to go like, back a little bit. I, you know what? We don't even I have to touch on that one. We could just touch on, you you already mentioned that you wrestled Owen so many times. Just the the amount of matches you've had with Owen Hart. You want to touch on those matches. Talk me through every time you got in the ring with Owen Hart, because he was such a gifted storyteller in that ring. Talk me through any of those matches. Sure. Well, first of all, I even had his tryout match in Bristol, Tennessee. Uh, I think it was, I think it was a, uh, a it was a TV taping or it could have been a Raw. And he just flew in from Calgary. So I didn't even know him then. And we got to know each other, and he gained my, he earned my respect, I earned his respect, and we just had a lot of technical wrestling matches, like as Owen Hart, when he was teamed up with Coco, when he was the Blue Blazer, uh, the main event Survivor Series in Boston Gardens when I was the Red Knight, so we've had a lot of 
technical wrestling matches, and I loved wrestling him because he's my style. And it was just back and forth, just um, a lot of high spots, a lot of wrestling, a lot of submission holds, a lot of amateur wrestling, a little bit of everything. And in my opinion, almost every match was flawless or near perfect. I think the least we've ever went was 10 minutes, which to me is a warm-up. I could go about 20 minutes to a half hour with Owen Hart any day of the week, twice on Sunday. Is there anybody uh, in your time when you're around all those legends and you were, you know, you were working your way up through the ranks, is there anyone in those time periods that you didn't get a chance to wrestle that you would have liked to mix it up with? Mm -hmm. Uh, One person, well, I wrestled almost everybody I wanted to wrestle. There's one person I would have loved to wrestle, but he was signed, but it was, I was still wrestling, but I wasn't there. I would love to wrestle Kurt Angle. Hmm. I have so much respect for him, and I never even met him. And the main reason I have so much respect for Kurt Angle, a couple of things. Number one, the man is an Olympic gold medalist in wrestling. How many Americans could say that? I don't know of any. No, not a lot. Okay, that's number one. And I don't mean alternate. I don't mean bronze. I don't mean silver. I'm talking about legit gold medalist wins, the, wins this medal with a broken neck. I have never, ever, and I've been around wrestling over 20 years, been around a lot of guys. I have never seen anybody catch on from the amateur rank, ranks to the pro ranks as quick as Kurt Angle. What do I mean by that? His style, his look, his promos. They're perfect. He's the perfect wrestler, in my opinion. Technical wrestler, looks great, smart. And look at his resume. It's flawless. It's legit. There's other guys that have did uh, Brand Rangans, I think, was an alternate in the Olympics. Jesse Barr. There's there's a few. Um, uh, Bad News Allen took a bronze medal in judo. Ronda Rousey. But they're not an Olympic gold medals wrestler. Mm-hmm. And he's the only one I know. And most of them don't pan out real well in the pro ranks. They do all right. But they don't do as good as Kurt did. I got to give him a lot of props. No, yeah, you're right. He definitely, uh, definitely uh, transitioned from amateur to pro was was very flawless and very easy. Mm-hmm. Um, yep. In terms of, uh, you actually touched on something earlier, and this is a fascinating point because I've never been able to talk to to a legend about this, and this question's kind of burned a hole in my pocket, so I'm going to ask it now. You mentioned okay. how you were training, you know, year and a half, working, gaining the knowledge, getting better, getting, getting getting understanding things so much more quicker every day but nowadays it seems like a lot of these guys are turning it out three months six months some of them don't even go on the indies some of them get built through the system like the wwe performance center all that kind of stuff what is your take on that do you think if if you had the opportunity to get built in through the system like the wwe performance center or earn your stripes on the indie scene where do you stand on that and how long do you think the training should be before these guys actually get into a ring, and wrestle in front of the big crowds? Well, first of all, I, you know, I can't really give a definitive definitive answer. Of course, I'm going to go with old school the way I was. It doesn't make me, because I was, uh, you know, some people think the same way as me, younger, older. I believe in paying your dues. I believe, I, really, if it had my way, everybody should break in in Japan. Okay. Then come to the States. And why, why is that? Because you'll learn about discipline, you'll learn about starting from the very, very bottom and working your way up. You'll learn about wrestling, you'll learn about how to take some abuse, you'll toughen up really quick, because they work tight in Japan. And if you don't know how to wrestle in Japan, you're there Monday night, Tuesday morning, you're on a plane back to the States because you don't know how to work. Oh, that's yeah. No, that's I, I've heard that before. I actually heard that from. I had the opportunity to sit down with Santino Morella a few weeks ago, and he kind of mentioned the same thing that he really learned and grew as a performer sure. in, in Japan because of. You learn how to, yeah, you learn how to you learn how to everything stretch, discipline, respect. Um, I don't know of these new training camps. I would have to actually sit there and watch what they do. Some do old school. Some do new. Some, I just can't believe, you can't spit them out three months. It, it's just impossible. Not properly, anyway. You're going to half-ass it. That's what's happened. That's my opinion. Um, that's the way I was taught, and, you know, who knows? Let's 
let's say I was right now 22 years old, 25, and I'm breaking in. I wouldn't know, so I have to go with the flow. I have to go the way I'm taught, who's teaching you. But there's still old school uh, wrestling schools. There's new school, I'm sure. I don't know how uh, these new uh, uh, performance centers work, how they how they do different things. I only know how I was broken in and how I was taught. And I really think, call me biased, call me, uh, um, whatchamacallit, um, I don't know to, let's say, biased or just my opinion, but I just think Malenko was the best, the way he taught me. After I see what's going on in the wrestling business and how guys are taught, I mean, I've asked different guys that have been around. I know guys that have been around as long as me, un- maybe less than me, more than me, and I'll cert- do some certain things or certain lingo I'll talk, and they didn't even know. You know, that's just because, you know, just not traveling or got a, you know, road smart. So, right, for sure. That's how I look at that. No, and that, and that's a fantastic point. Thank you for answering honestly, which is what I appreciate. Sure. Yeah. Um, in terms of WWE creative process, because there's a lot of talk nowadays, especially about the creative process of WWE and what they kind of do, and sometimes how things are thrown together a little bit last minute, this and that. Did you ever have anything creatively when the creative team was working with you? Anything that was kind of a head scratcher and was like, I'm not going to do that. Or, uh, I don't feel comfortable doing that. Or was there, or were you just a go with the flow type of guy? Like, yeah, I'll do it. I'm okay with it. Here's the thing. <clears throat> You're getting paid big money to do your dream. You're not doing nothing illegal. Okay. Basically, this is sports entertainment. Go with the flow. You don't do it, somebody else will, and they're going to make the big money. I don't care what it is. Ask Terry Taylor when he did the Red Rooster. What a pro. How about Kurt Angle as a pro? Certain things, I won't go into everything, certain things he's did in the ring and took losses and this and that, he's an ultimate professional. That doesn't make you weak. It makes you a pro. It doesn't mean you don't care. It makes you a pro. Because if you're worried about your stats, and your win-loss record, well, then you need to quit pro wrestling and call Dana White up and say you want to be a UFC fighter and get your ass beat in 30 seconds. Because that's what's going to happen, tough guys. All these tough guys, you get in there with Brock Lesnar, you get in there with Matt Hughes, you get in there with Randy Couture, Chuck Liddell, whoever's on the current roster now, you're going to get your ass beat, stretched, and hooked. And it's not going to be pleasant. No, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's another great valid point for sure. Because you hear, you hear a lot of things like behind the scenes now, especially of all these wrestlers, because with AEW kind of creeping into the fold, you hear all these wrestlers mm-hmm. saying that while well, they're doing everything so much more creatively because they're actually run by wrestlers, this and that. And then I look mm-hmm. at the WWE product and I look at the evolution. I look at the eighties mm-hmm. and the nineties where it was a little mm-hmm. bit kind of cartoony. Then I look at the attitude era. Then I look mm-hmm. at the ruthless aggression era. And now we're in the PG era. The company has grown. And the people like myself who were big, I was big, I was really, really into it in the Attitude Era. Once I grew up, the Attitude Era grew up with me. Now I have kids of my own. And I love making, both my daughters are big fans of wrestling like I am and my wife is. And we love to sit around and we love the WWE product for what it is. Because we understand what it is. It's there for the families. It's family entertainment. Right. Whereas AEW is not so much family entertainment. AEW is more for the hardcore wrestling fans. Mm-hmm. And, and I, I see the frustrations and sometimes a lot of the character things. And even as a fan, I sit back and I watch. I'm like, ah, I don't know if that was the right way for that character to go or this, that. But I'm not getting paid the big bucks. So I have right to right. complain because I'm just a fan. But when you, when you hear these frustrations, especially coming to light, do you think that that makes these pros, and I'm not going to name any names, but do you think that makes these pros less professional because they're actually airing their grievances out publicly? Yeah, that's wrong. You don't do that. You keep it in-house. Um, it's unprofessional. Behind closed doors. And some of these guys are whining and crying and getting paid big money for ridiculous things. Go with it. Now, if it doesn't work and you're trying your ass off and they're not accepting it, then that's their problem and they're wrong. You see what I mean? But if you're bitching and complaining, I don't want to get be I, a bunch of stuff, well, you're going to get replaced and you're unprofessional. Once again... If you're worried about that record, join the UFC. Right. No, yeah, for sure. In terms of, um, you know, everyone's kind of got, we talked about your dream match, a guy you wish you would have wrestled. If you, like, let's say you were to get a phone call tomorrow from, say, Vince McMahon, and he would say, Barry, I want you to come back. 
want you to wrestle anybody you want on the current roster. Is there anybody there now that you would love to mix it up with if you ever could get the opportunity to? Wow. I don't know the current roster. Like, I don't watch wrestling. Uh, See, uh, George, when I watch wrestling, Mm -hmm. this is how it works with me. Mm -hmm. If I'm flipping the channels and what have you, and I see... I'll just give two names just off the top of my head, and I'll just uh, go with it there. If I see Kurt Angle wrestling Triple H, I'm going to stop and watch. Okay. If I see Doink the Clown wrestling... uh, If I see Doink the Clown wrestling uh, um, Sergeant Slaughter, I'm not going to watch. I'm not interested. I know it's going to be a bit more entertaining than I want. See, I want entertainment with wrestling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I've noticed, I had flipped the channels one night of Ring of Honor. I was pretty impressed with uh, certain things in there. A lot of innovative stuff guys are doing. The only thing I don't like about today's product is too many long high spots. You're smarting up the people and it's choreographed. Too long. You don't need that much. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm lost in the times, but you're doing high impact moves and not pinning the guy. I mean, I'm seeing pile drivers from the top and 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 moonsaults and swantons, everything, all this stuff. It's beautiful, and then you beat them with a small package. Right. See, the psychology is not there, <clears throat> and you're losing the people. I mean, these moves are really good. Sometimes they're too fast. They're not registered. In pro wrestling, certain things need to be fast by psychology reasons. Some things need to be slow and methodical. So the fan in the cheap seats goes, wow, he hit him with a haymaker. What a punch. But if you do a short little punch and quick, the guy goes, what did he do? How did he hurt him? See what I mean? I got you. Yeah, the the psychology is kind of lost nowadays for sure. Yeah, you've got to, you know, you, you get hit with a unbelievable clothesline and you're up before him. I'm going, what? Well, what happened? Because let me tell you something. You get hit with a clothesline in a real fight and everything. You're not getting up that quick. Yeah, so you're saying kind of nowadays the, the, the ability to sell has been lost. Yeah, you need to sell, especially, I mean, everybody does, but especially a baby face. I mean, watch Ricky Morton sell. Watch Rick Steamboat sell. Jay Youngblood, Jack Briscoe. I mean, they get the sympathy. They're not looking like a puss or a whiner or a wuss. They're looking like a hurt athlete. I mean, it does happen. We're not 10 foot tall and bulletproof, but when he makes that comeback, look out. Yeah, for sure. No, the up and down moments. Yeah, you know what? You're right. I haven't really watched a a match uh, too much lately nowadays where where the up and down, the emotional value is actually there. And that's that's something I kind of do miss. In terms of your career and all the matches that you've had and all the fantastic talent that you've wrestled and mixed it up with, is there one match that sticks out in your mind, it's kind of like your crowning achievement, your absolute best, where you were in there with your perfect dance partner, you told a perfect story, and it was literally a perfect match. We touched on Owen Hart a bit, but is there anybody else that you you mixed yeah. it up with in your years that yeah. was, that was one I of would, my best matches? There's actually a couple, George. Okay. I would say, you know, Owen Hart's in, the, in my top five. I'm going to go with uh, Tim White, Lightning Horner, Brad Armstrong, Scott Armstrong, Brady Boone, Reno Riggins. Uh, Had some pretty good matches with Hector Guerrero going back and forth, you know, as far as technical aspect. Um, Wow. I'm sure there's more Franz Schumann in Austria. That was a goodie. That was up there in the top ten. Wow. Of course, uh, Chris Candido. Can't leave him out real technical uh, back and forth matches we've had because we've had numerous um, numerous ones and I've had some good ones in Japan with Japanese wrestlers which they're phenomenal you know back in the day uh, Mazawa um, wow I'm trying to think of everybody's names there they're so they're, they're so hard to uh, remember and pronounce <laughs> I remember Mazawa and Johnny Ace of course and uh Wow, the Patriot, and had some really good matches with uh, Tommy Wildfire Rich, and uh, wow, yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's more Brady Boone, Um, had some good matches with Dr. Death, Steve Williams, Terry Gordy, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, you, you know, honestly, the names you're listing are, I'm sitting here and I'm yeah. thinking like, man. I, Bob, I, I, Bob Orton Jr. is phenomenal. Oh. Yeah, he's up there. Yeah. Don Morocco. Holy crap. I mean, this man, A to Z, he's perfect. The look, the promos, his wrestling, he's a vicious heel, and he's a technical wrestler. And he's a great guy and a great athlete. Wow, you, you've really mixed it up with, you've had quite and the you know, career, sir. <laughs> George, I don't have to say this, but I'm going to say it anyway because this is my DNA. When I say these about things like Malenko's and other people, it's not ass-kissing. This is just pure professionalism. I would say this to somebody, my neighbor or somebody down the street, I'm going to be the same way. It's not a, this, this, this talk is an entertainment. This is a shoot. Yeah, absolutely. That's how I am. And There's I, no reason. And There's I, no reason. I mean, if I if I'm going for something, what am what am I achieving now in my career? I would love to be some kind of mentor or trainer for the WWE or the promotion in Jacksonville. Mm-hmm. And if they don't see talent in me with my resume, then they don't know wrestling. I'm not putting myself over. I'm just being honest. And if they don't believe that, why don't you just give me a test and see what happens and see what how I turn out in a couple months. Absolutely, for sure. No, and and the honesty is is what I appreciate the most. But let's touch on let's touch on that for a second. At all your seminars, at all the you know the events you're going to, the signings and stuff like that. If you had a young young up and coming kid come up to you and they really wanted to get in the wrestling business and they asked you one piece of advice, what would you say to them? I would say, keep your mouth shut and listen, and do what you're told, no matter what. And what about like taking risks or anything like that? Like if they come up to you and say, you know, like I'm really, I really want to take the risks and go out there and shoot for it all. Would you, would you be okay in saying, yeah, go for it? Or would you say, you know, baby steps, you gotta, like, you gotta crawl before you can walk. It could be a little bit of both, George. It depends on the guy. It depends on the situation. You know, you could be, you could be top dog and that doesn't mean Vince is going to take you. That doesn't mean nothing. I mean, you know, it, 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 it's 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 weird how that works. I mean, you could be a great talent. You, why isn't he? Why isn't he on top? Why isn't he world champ? Why isn't he in Hall of Fame? Why is he this? Why is he that? Well, there's a lot of guys in the NFL, NBA, hockey. I mean, boxing, MMA. It's it's weird how that works. It's a lot of politics and the networking. I hate to say it. I mean, normally the cream rises to the top, but sometimes it doesn't. And this happens in country music too. You go. Why isn't he this? Why isn't that? Some deserve to be there. Some don't. It all depends on the situation. It's weird how that works. I don't agree with it. I believe you should get, you know, you should get um, your bonus points and, and the pecking order. That's what I think it should be. That's how it should work. But who am I to say that? And, and actually, <laughs> I, I wanted to talk to you about one other thing because I noticed on your Facebook page, which we will shout out at the end of the at the end of the interview. Sure. But I noticed that uh, there was kind of a push. Uh, you kind of have one of your your promotional shots there with a with a Hall of Fame. Is that in the near future? Are we pushing for that? Have you gotten uh, any any interest or any well, peaks? <clears throat> George, I'll be honest with you. In all honesty, I'm not putting myself over. I think I deserve to be there. I really do. I mean. The Hall of Fame is, you know, it's kind of, uh, I don't know what it is, but, you know, when you got Kid Rock in there and Bob Euchre and stuff, I mean, maybe they contributed, but did you really pay your dues? Did you go up and down the road like I did? Did you wrestle for barely anything? Did you pay your dues? Did you go to the dance? Did you climb that mountain? No, you didn't. Okay, I'm not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. I'm not in the Hall of Fame of the NFL. And either is Dan Marino. He's not in the WWF Hall of Fame. Let's just stick to our genre, folks. And I really believe I deserve to be there. I think you do, too. And going back and doing the research that I did to prepare for this interview, I wanted to make the interview light and fun and and have a great conversation, which I think we've had. But in doing the research and and, and figuring and finding out, kind of going back and and figuring out who you wrestled and who you mix it up with. And and stats aside, win and loss records, they don't matter because you said you were a consistent professional. But who you wrestled and and kind of who you paved the way with. Because if you think about it, there were a lot of guys who were probably, you know, at the time training, going like, I mean, like, you know what, this guy's kind of one of us. He's just a, he's a regular guy, but he's got the ability and he's got the skill. And you know what? He made the best 
out of a, a situation. Yeah, the win-loss record, it's not the greatest, but the fact is you were a consistent professional. And for a while there, you were the kind of jobber that got over. Once you had those, once you had that kind of thing happen, you were the kind of guy that was just supposed to, or the way it was set up in our opinion as fans, you were supposed to be the one-off or two-off jobber. But then you got the surprise win. You had the promos with Skip, like the the, the back and forth with Skip for the body donnas and stuff like that. You got a little bit bigger. I mean, that's cool. That's kind of that Cinderella man story, if you think about it, right? Right. right. Yeah, there's a difference. I want to correct you on one thing. The word jobber. Sure. Okay. That's old school from probably gorgeous George days. Okay. It's a slang. That's basically what it is. But really, it's enhancement. That That's the word I use. I don't use jobber because, first of all, it just sounds crude or it just sounds like he's a piece of shit. You know, it just sounds... And I did not mean that. I, if that's the way oh, it no, came no, no, I apologize. I'm not, I'm not angry. No, no. I, I'm just... If you said it once and it was okay and you said it again, I said, yeah, I'm just going to defend it a little bit. I believe in enhancement. Really, nobody should be, you know, jobbed or what have you, but... You're going to have some guys that it has to be. Now, nowadays, it doesn't work that way. It's back and forth, and you and you, and you you lose. But not everybody could be Shawn Michaels. Not everybody could be Kevin Nash, Scott Hall, uh, Bob Backlund, Hulk Hogan. You can't. You've got to have a winner and a loser. I mean, the Patriots lost to the Giants. Come on. Um, NHL, basketball, gymnastics. It has to be. But when it's said and done and the smoke clears and you're on your way home from the match – Wow, Barry Horowitz lost to Owen Hart, but he almost beat him, like, by a centimeter. He put up a fight. It's just that it, was his, it wasn't his night. He, he was on the shorter end. That's how you want to leave that. See, that's how, that's how you do it. But when you get just destroyed, I don't believe in that. But sometimes it is needed once in a while on TV to get somebody over like a monster. Like, I remember... Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I was there. Actually, I watched the monitor. I remember when Ultimate Warrior destroyed Honky Tonk Man on Monday Night Raw in about one minute and won the Intercontinental title. Yep. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yep. I, I, I'm not sure okay. if it was Monday Night Raw, it but yeah, you're right. Done and give props to uh, Wayne Honky Tonk Man for being professional. I saw it happen with my own eyes. Frank the Hammer Goodish. A.K.A. Bruiser Brody destroyed Rocky Johnson on Florida Championship Wrestling in one minute. See, when it's done right, you go, holy shit, that's a monster. You do it every time? No. Come on now. I understand, like, for instance, the gimmick with Goldberg, you're next, you're next, the win-loss record. That's pretty cool. But it all depends. Those days are kind of gone. But... You know, a good enhancement person like myself, there, there's a difference. For instance, I could get myself over, get the match over, get Brad Armstrong over, but at the same time, I could get myself over, and the next night, in a semi-main event in Madison Square Garden, basically, I almost, almost could do it all. That's a, that's a fair point. And my final question before we wrap this up, sure. and we'll get you to shout out uh-huh. your socials at the end of it. Uh, are you a fan of stipulation matches or are you just a classic one-on-one? Like, I mean, I, when I talk about stipulation, I'm talking about, you know, steel cage, falls count anywhere, you know, uh, Iron Man you matches. Know, are you a fan of those? Or are you just a fan of the classic yeah, one-on-one? I'm glad you asked that. That's a good question, George. I like, I really think, this is my opinion. I like the old ones that just to add some entertainment on the card every now and then. I like the lights out match. No, no uh, falls count anywhere in the building match. A Texas death match. A Texas bull rope match. The blindfolded match that I think Rick Martell and Jake the Snake Roberts did. You know, you do it every now and then. It's an entertainment thing, but the people like it. But, you know, I, I really like that lights out match, the no DQ match, the I quit match. They're, they're intriguing. They're 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 crowd pleasers, in my opinion. Oh yeah, no oh, yeah. Some of my actually one of my favorite matches is uh, the Rock versus Mick Foley I Quit match late ninety seven ninety eight ish. That's right. one of my favorite ones, just because it literally was it was everywhere and it was so much used. Yep, I got to tell you, my favorites are Texas Death matches in Florida. 
uh, with different people. They would use that. See, in Florida, they would work an angle for a year, like let's say Buddy Colt against uh, Cowboy Bill Watts. Mm -hmm. They would do that for a year, get a program out of that storyline. I mean it, build it up. And then finally, the big thing, the end match of all matches, the Texas death match or the no – the no disqualification. Finally, you do every match, and that's the blow off, and you finally end the angle or the storyline. Wow. Yeah. No, that, that now, sounds. Gonna, I got to tell you, my favorite. I'll never forget Saturday night's main event Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff against the great Hulk Hogan steel cage match. And they got the clock on the left side of your TV and the right side. And they both jump off, but who hit the floor first by one second? Hulk Hogan. Yeah, yeah, I remember See what that. I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Paul got beat, but look how he got beat. Got See beat. what I'm getting at? Yeah, got beat in legendary status, and he almost won. You're right. You can always remember those almost win it. situations. And yeah. that match was cool. That was awesome. Plus, by the way, I forgot to mention Paul Arndorf. He's a phenom. I mean, this man could do it all. Amateur wrestle, football, fight, pro wrestler, his promos, his look. He was flawless. Even his name, Mr. Wonderful, Paul Orndorff. Yeah, definitely. He's an icon. Yeah, he is a friggin', he's a friggin' icon. It rolls off the tongue. All right, and you know what? Just one other question for a little bit of fun, if you can. Do you have any? Do you have any great road stories? A classic road story that was something that was just hilarious that you can share with us? I got a ton. There's just some I can't say. I don't want to get in trouble and don't want to incriminate anybody. Okay. But uh, let me think of something lighthearted. Um, let me think. Wow. Let me see. Think of one. Oh yeah, I got one. Okay. I love this one. It's funny. You know Nails. Yep. Kevin Kelly. Mm hmm Well, he loves cars. He's a legit bounty hunter, by the way. Repo man, what have you. Uh, Minnesota Tough uh, tough Man Contest winner. Uh, one of the few people that Brad Rangins tried to submit in the training camp, and Nails would not give up. That's how tough he is. You got Brad Rangins on top of you, stretching you in half, and he would not submit. Wow. Yeah. Anyway, he's a great guy. He's a big guy. Um, we're in a rent-a-car. I think it was a Cadillac, maybe. And we're driving through St. Louis on the way to a show. I'm in the passenger side. He's driving. Two things he did. Let's see. Let's see. They were both on the way home, if I'm not mistaken. He pulled off to the side of an apartment complex, it looked like. But... Like today, there was no kids. There was nobody around. It really wasn't in the apartment complex. It was the side street. And he loves cars. He casts a car. He'll tell you what size engine, what size tires. Pretty impressive, you know. He he liked that. He was like a human stat machine for, for automobiles. And he pulls off. Again, we're in St. Louis. And he pulls off, and he puts his foot on the brake and punches this rent-a-car. Wheels are smoking, tires are squealing for about a minute. Then he lets off, and, he, and, and the car takes off, and he stops. He looks at me, says, Barry, I just took 4,000 miles off those tires. Too bad. <laughs> I'm cracking up, and I'm also looking at him like, are you psychotic? Are you real? Are you joking? Is this a rib? What's going on? But it was all in jest, and he was laughing, and I was laughing, and it was cool, and it was safe. At the same time, we get back on the interstate, and we're driving, and I said, hey, Nails, I, I need to, back then, you would use a pay phone or your AT&T credit card. I would anyway. It was, uh, and I said, I need to call my wife. I said, I got to touch base with her. I, I call her every night, and we're driving, and all of a sudden, he takes an, an exit ramp about 80 miles an hour. Because he missed it, and he realized he needs to take it. But he didn't. He's safe. I'll give him credit. I mean, I'm buckled up and everything. I go, what the heck was that about? He goes, you told me you needed to talk to your wife, and I'm getting you to a payphone. <laughs> he was very serious, too. That's and awesome. I said, thanks. I appreciate it. <clears throat> Scared the hell out of me, 80 miles an hour out of nowhere, taking an exit ramp in St. Louis. But got to the payphone, made my call. And that was it for tonight. He, the, all the... Uh, Theatrics were over after that. I was happy too. Yeah, you were. Yeah, I'm sure after those two, those two heart stopping moments. 
Well, yeah, heart stopping moments is the word. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, very. Oh it, yeah. It's, I mean, there's many more. I, I I can't think of off the top of my head. Uh, some of them are. Uh, I think I remember one story that I was told. I don't know how true this is, so don't quote me on this. Okay. You know where Alligator Alley is in Florida, right? I've heard of it. I've never been to it, but I've heard of it, yes. Okay. It's a long 100-mile stretch of pitch black, water moccasins, alligators, trees. You get stuck, you better have a cell phone. But I don't know how true this is, and I like this guy, so I don't want to quote or anything, but I could have swore, I don't know who did it, maybe Steve Kern, but I guess it was... I think it was Mike Rotundo, but I'm not sure. And I think he said he had to get out and go to the bathroom or something. <laughs> he did, and they took off. Oh, no. Yeah, but I don't think they took off for long. I think they just stopped, but that's scary because there's nothing out there. It's pitch black for 100 miles. No, no gas. Station. There's just trees, swamps, and scariness. Well, yeah, it sounds like and, something and out of a said, really cool horror movie. that says, you know, check your gas tank. <laughs> you know, you're, go, you're going through Alligator Alley. If I'm not mistaken, it's 100 miles. I'm not positive. Wow. Yeah, no, for sure. That sounds something out of a really cool horror movie, though. That's for sure. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's so many funny things that have happened in my career. Um, just I, right now, I'm, I'm a little lost trying to think of them. And probably the ones I think of, I can't, I can't tell. Well, I don't want to make you incriminate anybody, but it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you, sir. Uh, I appreciate oh, yeah. the time. I appreciate it. I, I know uh, you're from Canada. Yes. Am I right? Okay. Yes. i got to give props to Canadian fans right now. From Toronto to Regina to Calgary, Vancouver, Medicine Hat. I mean, I've been to almost every major town in Canada. Montreal, all... Uh, there was some independent shows, which were phenomenal, but mostly were for Vince. And I got to say, the uh, Canadian fans are just very, very respectful. It reminds me of Japanese a little bit. And they know they're wrestling. And again, they like wrestling. And when I say wrestling, that's what it says outside on the marquee in Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Wrestling. Right. They love it. That's why they love the hearts. They wrestle. Stu Hart. The Hart Brothers, Owen, Brett, Stu Hart Jr., the name, the list goes on and on. They are all technical wrestlers, and they're great, and so is Stu Hart. Rest in peace. Absolutely. The whole the amount of hearts that we've lost over the years is uh it's sad, but you know what? They're all up there and they're all wrestling they're all wrestling special shows for the Angels, hundred percent for sure. Oh, definitely. Owen, it should have never happened. It was a total accident. People like Owen Hart, Barry Horowitz, Brad Armstrong, Tim Horner, Brady Boone, Reno Riggins, all your other technical wrestlers in this world uh, don't need to fly from the ceiling. Yeah. If that's the gimmick, our gimmick is, we know how to wrestle. Yeah. No, you're, See you're, what I mean? You're 100% you like right. Your, I'm not going to mention names. I don't feel like it right now. But the guys that can't wrestle, they need to fly from the ceiling because they don't know how to do anything else. You're right. No, I, I don't disagree uh, with you, sir. It, it, it shouldn't have happened. Uh, he's a team player. I don't know if I would have did that. If I felt uncomfortable, um, I would have had to say something to Vince. Uh, and, and he should respect that. I did everything I can for you in this company. I'll do anything you want, but I'm a little afraid of heights or I'm claustrophobic. Please respect that. And if something happens, all I had to do was say no. Otherwise, my, my wife and son grow up without the father and husband. I'm not doing that because family first with me. And that and that's that's nobody can nobody can disrespect that. That's a hundred percent truth, and and I appreciate that as well because I'm a family man now as well. Uh, did you want right. to shout out your socials real quick before we wrap this up? Yeah, I wanted to say I'm new to Facebook. I've been out there about a month. Check me out. Uh, follow me, friend. Uh, everything's on there where I do my meet and greets. And uh, once again, I'm seeking that uh, that coaching job for WWE or the. the I'm, I'm sorry, the promotion in Jacksonville is called AEW. Uh, AEW, yep. A, right. And uh, I'm seeking that, and uh, check me out. And, um, yeah, uh, just uh, you can follow me also on WWE.com, MrTechnical.info, BarryHorowitz.com. Uh, I do need to say about that Kurt Angle is a great wrestler, but Mr. Technical Barry Horowitz wrestles great. <laughs> 100%. There you go. Well, Barry, thank you so much for the time. 
again, it was an absolute honor. And anytime you want to do it again, man, you just let me know. I would love to have you back on the show. 45 minutes, flew. I blinked my eyes and we're done. I, I can't believe it. Yeah. Wow. That was, uh, it was uh, a great interview. You did great. And uh, I hope all the wrestling fans uh, like it. And I got to say something that my wrestling fans are really respectful and they really turn out and I had a big t- uh, turnout in Monroe, New Jersey uh, Saturday and it was really great and uh, thanks for everybody coming out there if they're listening to this podcast I mean they were I mean I got there at 10 in the, I got there at 10 to 10 in the morning I started signing at 10 o'clock and it didn't stop till 3 and I mean non-stop people non-stop well, that's I what mean, they do. Was, they came out to incredible. see Mr. Technical, it right? Was incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds like it was a great and time. I can't wait to come to Canada. I can't wait to come to Canada again and wrestle in Toronto. Or I love Toronto. It's very Americanized. The food is great. The gyms are clean. The health food stores, your hotels, and just your buildings and everything. Everything there. Plus, Shania Twain's from Canada. Yeah, there the you heads? go. And so is Terry Clark. That's right. That's right. Oh, you got to support. You got to support country music now. Yeah, absolutely, 100%. Well, Barry, thank you so much. It was a great pleasure speaking with you, and I can't wait to do it again. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Enjoy your evening. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, guys. That was Barry Horowitz. That was an amazing interview. So honored and blessed to be able to talk with him. And I can't say it enough. The podcast has made me talk to a lot of people, and I appreciate it. I appreciate you guys, as always, the fan base. Thank you so much. And have a safe, have a safe night. Enjoy your evening. And we'll see you guys next week for another great episode. Take care. Peace. Thank you for listening. Tune in next week for another episode on Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, and iHeartRadio. Also follow us on Facebook at Straight Talk Wrestling, on Instagram at Straight Talk Wrestling, and on Twitter at underscore Straight Talk. And for all our merchandise, you can search us on ProWrestlingTees.com. Thank you.